Good afternoon, friends. It's a beautiful balmy day down here in southern Illinois. Uh, you can see I'm in shirt sleeves, no uh, winter coat. Uh, the neighbor's chickens are cackling as they are scratching in the leaves. But it's still nippy. And there's still ice on the stream. So um, I, let's get this on, because uh, I don't think I'm going to last long here. This is not a feel-good story today and it doesn't make me look good. But I think it's a story that needs telling. It's a conversation that we need to have. And I'm the only one that can tell the story. It was 1 a.m. in the morning. My first year of residency, that's the final stage of education for a doctor. And my current assignment was on the obstetrical ward. That night, we had multiple mothers in delivery, and we had three mothers that needed C-sections. We had just finished the first when the nurse handed me a message. It read, uh, one of your patients has been admitted to pediatrics. Please give orders. Now, as a family practice doctor, turn, learning to provide continuity of care, caring for people over time was an important part of my training. So I had my own roster of patients, many of whom I've not met yet. And one of the children that I was responsible for, one of the families I was responsible for, had been admitted to the pediatric unit. I had 30 minutes between that C-section and the next, so I raced down to the pediatric, pediatric ward and went in, did a quick assessment, talked with the mother about asthma, which her child had, and what the standard treatment was, and then went out to write the orders. Now, the, the drug of choice in those days was aminophilin. It's a cousin of caffeine, and uh, it relaxed that relaxes the muscles in the airways and the lungs and helps you to breathe easier. The problem is that the margin between when, <laughs> boy, the shadows are weird in the afternoon here. The margin between when the, the beneficial effect of the drug occurs and when side effects occur is so small that it's very difficult to get right. Not enough drug and there's no benefit. Too much and side effects occur. Nausea, vomiting, tremulousness, think about a coffee high. Um, and in severe cases, you end up having seizures, your heart starts beating irregularly. It can kill you. So there's a very careful, very complex formula uh, that has to be used to calculate exactly how much of the medication to give. I scratched through the mathematics and uh, wrote the orders, called my supervising physician and, and uh, told him what I had done. He asked me a couple of questions and, and uh, then I raced back to the obstetrical ward to scrub in on the next C-section. When we got done, the nurse handed me another note. Come to pediatrics immediately. I ran. When I got there, the nurse was frantic. About 15 minutes after she started the infusion of the aminophilin, the child started vomiting and hadn't stopped. I went in, examined the child, talked to the mother. came back out to, and looked at my orders and stared in disbelief. I had miscalculated the dosage by a factor of 10. There was a very good reason the child was vomiting. The nurse and I huddled and came up with a plan of action. We used some medications to ease the discomfort. We 
check the blood level to find out how high it was, to calculate how long we needed to wait before giving more of the medication. We put on a heart monitor to detect irregular rhythms. And then I raced back up to scrub in on the next C-section. When I finished that one, there was no message. So I went to pediatrics on my own. The vomiting had stopped, the child was sleeping, and I breathed a sigh of relief. In the midst of all this, I had called my supervising physician to inform him of what had happened, and he said we'd deal with it in the morning. So in the morning, refreshed and awake with two hours of sleep, I met him on the pediatric unit and endured a tongue lashing, which was not inappropriate. Then we went in to speak with the mother, but as we approached the door of the room, the doctor grabbed me by the collar and drug me unceremoniously through the door and deposited me in front of the mother and said, I don't know if you know it, ma'am, but this idiot almost killed your child last night. Those words have been seared into my brain. Her eyes opened wide and she stared at me in shock and I stared at her in shock and I really don't remember much more that happened that morning. The upshot of the it all was that um, I was in deep trouble. In the end, um, some of the faculty were calling for an end to my career. The cooler heads prevailed and instead I was put on prob probation. Um, a mandatory course of re-education in all of pharmacology was prescribed and uh, every order that I wrote for the next six months had to be personally reviewed by one of the faculty, which made it really difficult for me to walk in the door every morning and pretend to be a doctor. Have you ever made a mess? I mean a big mess, not a boo-boo, a big mess. Lifting your head and carrying on while maintaining integrity is painful. I went to my first session with the faculty member who was assigned to me to do the re-education in pharmacology, only to discover that he had written the textbook that was the gold standard for pharmacology at the time. How was I ever going to measure up to his expectations? I mean, he knew stuff forwards and backwards, his whole whole thrust of his of his message to the medical the medical uh, providers was you have to know these drugs like the palm of your hand you have to know how they work how they get into the body um, how what happens to them once in their they're in the body uh, I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach when I realized what I was up against but his first question set me aback. He simply asked, what happened? And haltingly, I shared this story just like I've shared with you. When I finished, he said, what have you learned? I said, I've learned to always double check, double check my calculations of dosing. He said, good. What else? I've written the formula into my cheat book so I don't have to go chasing after it. Good. What else? Uh, 
Um, I've learned that the first time I use a drug with complex dosing or high risks, I need to ask somebody who's experienced in using it uh, to review my work. He said, good, what else? I was running out of what else's. And then he said something I've never forgotten. Steve, no man is an island. Yes, you made a mistake here. You made a big mistake. You made a mistake that could have had severe consequences. But you didn't make it in a vacuum. The pediatric ward took its weights in pounds, but all of the medical formulas are in kilograms, requiring a calculation every single time an opportunity for error. The nurses were afraid to question your orders because of the culture that exists in. The pharmacy didn't have access to the weight of the patient, so they couldn't double check your calculation. The list goes on and on. No man is an island. If we punish you, all we're doing is scapegoating you. You are the obvious culprit. You are the one caught red-handed. But the simple fact is, the problem goes much deeper than you. And I want you to know, you are not being scapegoated here. Yes, you have to go through this course and this re-education. And yes, I'm going to be demanding on your level of competence. But I want you to know that the entire organization is examining how it contributed to this event. And already, pharmacy is getting the weights on every pediatric patient. Already, nursing is looking at how to change the culture. Already, the administration is looking at their policies and the equipment that they provide to pediatrics to reduce medical errors. No man is an island. Frankly, I was blown away. I had never I had never experienced this kind of a response to wrongdoing. Last week, I broached the subject of accountability. And I asserted that Jesus' perspective on it was different. That rather than focusing on punishing the wrongdoer as being, being a administering accountability, he, he focused on encouraging people to keep their eye on the goal, what I termed looking up. But let me tell you, looking up is not easy to do. It requires a painful degree of looking in to examine why things happened. Not so that we can excuse them, but so that we can prevent them from happening again. And in my case, that led to re-education, supervision, intensive community support, and a healthy degree of self-discipline that's been ongoing for the rest of my career. But accountability is not limited to the individual. Accountability always involves the community. That looking in involves the entire context. And in a world that is so rife with injustice, with things going wrong, that can be overwhelming. It can feel like, well, can feel like we're letting the wrongdoer off easy and making the rest of us feel guilty. At least that's what we tell ourselves. So we inflict retribution and we demand justice, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Make him hurt like he made them hurt in an effort 
to create the illusion of safety and justice where there is no justice. No man is an island. Looking up requires looking in for all of us. And, and so I hope you can see that what, Jesus, what I see in Jesus, the, the, the standard he holds us to, the bar, where he sets the bar for his followers is so high up here. Oh man, he expects a lot from us. which to me is really admirable. And it doesn't matter whether his followers have measured up to that standard or not. That is their calling. And to me, that's something to admire, something to emulate, something to follow after. Whether or not I'm spiritual or religious, isn't that a calling worth responding to? So every week when I tell you to be safe, I mean it, friends. When I ask you to be prudent, I mean it. And when I ask you to look up, there's nothing flippant or positivity about that. Behind those simple words is the call for accountability. Resp taking responsibility that is very, very meaningful in my life. Is it in yours? Have a good week, friends, and keep looking up.